Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about a project called Mesos uh, that we've built at UC Berkeley. Um, it's a joint project with uh, Ben Heinemann, Andy Konwinski, Ali Godsey, Anthony, Andy, Scott, and Jan. And uh, with Mesos, we're fortunate enough to have actually started getting some real users for the project as well. Um, so uh, Twitter is actually using Mesos to run uh, about a dozen production services. And uh, researchers at uh, Berkeley and UCSF are using Mesos to run large-scale computations. And uh, so are engineers at Conviva. So I'm going to start with some background um, about the problem that we're looking at. Um, so, as everyone knows, uh, there's been a lot of uh, interest lately in uh, large-scale computation on uh, commodity clusters uh, because these clusters have become necessary to process uh, the data in a lot of application domains. And as a result of this, there has been a lot of innovation in uh, systems uh, for making these clusters easier to program. Uh, so new programming models and implementations of those programming models. And we're just going to call these systems frameworks uh, for the purpose of this talk. So just as uh, examples, you know, there's MapReduce and Dryad. These were some of the earliest ones. But there's a wide variety of other frameworks out there. Uh, for example, in the past two years, Google has talked about several other frameworks that are very different from MapReduce, including Pregel, which is a specialized model for graph processing, and Percolator, which is an incremental web indexing system. Um, and I've also put up two, two other ones that might seem um, a little out of place. Uh, first of all, there's MPI. So MPI sounds like something you, know, you would use in a, in a supercomputer, but actually users at Yahoo are also using MPI to process some of the data they have, just because it's a better programming model for the applications they want to do. And they also put up Ruby on Rails because web applications and interactive services are a big uh, portion of the data center workload. So what's the, what's the problem that we're trying to address? Um, the problem is that no single one of these frameworks will be optimal for all data center applications. So as a result of this, um, organizations really want to be able to run multiple frameworks in the same cluster. And running multiple frameworks in the same cluster um, is, uh, is uh, important for two reasons. Um, first of all, it maximizes utilization, and you know, data centers are expensive, so you want to get uh, high utilization out of them. And the second important reason for data intensive processing is that when you have big data sets, they're very costly to replicate. Uh, so you don't want to have to, you know, a petabyte data set for uh, MapReduce and then copy it for Pregel to a separate cluster. You would much rather have these things coexist in the same cluster and uh, with, uh, with access to the same storage nodes. So just to give you a sense of, of what we want to do here, so today, unfortunately, all these frameworks are developed independently. And uh, every framework assumes that it owns a set of nodes. So as a result, the only real way to, uh, to share a cluster between frameworks is to statically partition it, either among physical machines or virtual machines. But basically, you cut out a slice for each framework and let it run in there. Um, and of course, the downside of this is that you get poor statistical multiplexing, and the frameworks might have uh, peaks in, uh, in demand at different times, and you have a lot of uh, resources idle and uh, underutilization. So with Mesos, we'd like to move to a world where all these frameworks uh, can share a common resource pool dynamically, uh, and you can get uh, good statistical multiplexing. And there are two benefits to doing this. The first one is that maybe uh, jobs will finish faster because they'll be able to scale up uh, beyond the, the, the size you would have given to that one framework by itself. Um, and the second reason is that you might be able to run the same workload with fewer nodes. Or you might be able to run more workload on the same set of nodes you already have. So this is why we want to do statistical multiplexing. So to do this, we're going to move away from this world of independent frameworks and add a common resource sharing layer that all the frameworks talk to, uh, which is Mesos. And of course, in this talk, I'm, I'm going to, to talk about how, how to design such a layer uh, you know, to work well, to scale well, uh, and so forth. That's the main challenge we're looking at um, in this talk. So before I go into that, I also wanted to talk about two other benefits of adding uh, this kind of layer in place. Um, the first benefit, uh, which is maybe a little surprising, is that there's also a lot of value in using Mesos even if you only use a single framework, uh, such as, say, Hadoop. And uh, the reason is you can use Mesos to run multiple instances of Hadoop, 
And you can use this to isolate workloads, for example, to have separate clusters for production and uh, experimental uh, jobs so that you know, they, they can't um, cause each other to crash. Um, and you can also use it to run multiple versions of the framework and either deploy upgrades or you know, just, just test out several versions at the same time. And that's one of the benefits. Um, the other benefit is that once you have this common resource sharing layer in place, it becomes much easier to uh, build and deploy specialized frameworks for the applications that the general abstractions like MapReduce uh, don't perform well for. Um, and uh, you can just have these coexist with your existing MapReduce workload. You don't have to go and upgrade everything at once. And uh, in, in Mesos, we've built one such framework for iterative applications that can actually outperform Hadoop by a factor of 20 you know, without writing a lot of lines of code to do this. So that's, you know, that's a quick overview. Let me go into an outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to start with the goals and architecture for Mesos. Um, and uh, once I do that, I'll talk a little bit about the implementation. And I'll show some evaluation results. And after that, I'll, I'll conclude with some related work because there's, of course, a lot of uh, related work in this space. So let's start with the goals. Um, so we had four primary goals in mind with Mesos. First and foremost was to get high utilization. This is why we want to share the cluster uh, to begin with. Now, the second goal after that was to support a diverse array of frameworks, uh, including current frameworks and future frameworks, because these are constantly being developed. And this is actually important uh, to get good utilization as well, because if we design a scheduler that works for today's frameworks, but not for some future ones, you may have to go back to static partitioning for those uh, or, and, or go back to the drawing board. So we really wanted to be able to support a diverse array of frameworks. And after that, of course, we have the scalability and reliability uh, to work in a data center environment. So we've accomplished these goals by adopting a design that looks a little bit like a microkernel. It's a design where the MESO score is, uh, is very small and simple, and it pushes um, the scheduling decisions to the frameworks themselves. And this design allows us to support a diverse array of frameworks that do their own scheduling, and also makes it easier to make uh, Mesos scalable and robust. So we've been able to scale the Mesos master to, uh, to manage 50,000 slaves. And um, in terms of um, uh, fault recovery, all the state in the master is actually soft state. So we can very quickly recover it without needing any kind of replicated state machine or anything like that um, for the Mesos state. So um, in, in, in more detail, there are two, um, two primary elements to our design. Um, first of all, we have a fine-grained resource sharing model. What we mean by fine-grained sharing is that in contrast to, to static partitioning, uh, we let the jobs, uh, the, the frameworks, divide their computations into small units called tasks, and uh, we schedule at the level of tasks. So this helps us achieve higher utilization, uh, better latency for starting a new job, and also better data locality, as I'll talk about. And uh, this is, this, uh, this, we can do this for a lot of data center workloads because frameworks like MapReduce and Dryad already divide work into small tasks um, for load balancing and fault tolerance reasons. So now we just let them run these tasks on top of Mesos. The second element is this application controlled scheduling models, uh, model called resource software that lets us be scalable and lets the frameworks do their own scheduling. Now let me talk about each of those in turn. Um, so fine-grained sharing, I'm going to contrast that with, with uh, the coarser-grained sharing um, that, that you can do with static partitioning. Um, and the coarse-grained sharing is also uh, the, the most common one in, in uh, HPC schedulers for supercomputers. Uh, and it, it actually makes a lot of sense there because their jobs are coarse-grained. They don't scale up and down elastically. You, know, you, you just run on N nodes for some, some amount of time. Um, so with, with fine-grained sharing, um, we, we have these little tasks, and we can share nodes both in space and in time across frameworks. Um, and uh, one advantage we already talked about is utilization, because if, if you don't use your partition um, or with coarse-grained sharing, you, you still have those nodes. And here we can launch someone else's tasks on them. Um, the other benefit that's important in a data center is data locality. So let me talk a little about that. Um, so in these data centers, we have a, a shared um, storage system, usually, like the GFS or HDFS. And the storage system spans um, all the nodes. 
And if you do um, coarse-grained partitioning, then each framework will only be on a small fraction of the nodes, and it'll have to read data across the network. Um, with fine-grained sharing, on the other hand, frameworks can take turns running tasks on each node. So here, a task from framework three finished, and we launch one from framework one, and then here, a task from framework two finishes, and we launch one from framework three. Um, so in just in summary, these, these are the benefits um, of uh, fine-grained sharing. Okay. That was the easy one. Let's talk about resource offers, too. Um, so when we started Mesos, one, one thing we considered doing um, is building a, a single uh, centralized scheduler that will do all the scheduling. And here, the, this is, again, an approach in a lot of existing schedulers. Uh, the applications express their needs in some kind of uh, resource request language, and then the scheduler matches them to resources. One attractive thing about this model is that you can, you know, potentially make optimal scheduling decisions uh, because you have all the information if, if they can express it for you. Um, but there are several disadvantages that caused us to turn away from this. Um, one is just the complexity of, of designing a resource request language that captures the needs of all the frameworks, uh, and then designing a scheduler that can make sense of it and do something smart with those needs. Um, even if, if we could do something like that, it would be harder to make this, this uh, kind of system scalable and robust to, to make sure that it doesn't lose state on failure, for example. And lastly, the, the other big reason for us was that the future frameworks that are continuously coming out might have needs that we haven't anticipated, and then we risk having to go back to the drawing board. So in Mesos, we, we actually flip things around instead um, and, uh, and use a model called resource offers. Um, in resource offers, uh, Mesos tells the frameworks about available resources in the cluster rather than the frameworks telling Mesos about their needs. And then each framework uh, picks out of those, those resources which ones it wants to use and which of its tasks it wants to launch on them. So the benefit of this is that Mesos itself is simple and it's easy to add new frameworks onto it um, and have them do their own scheduling. Of course, one disadvantage is that the decisions may not be optimal, but we show that they're actually pretty good. And for, for example, for data locality, we have nearly 100% data locality using resource offers. Um, so resource software might seem like a, a, a strange way of doing things um, initially, but we actually do this kind of resource allocation um, fairly often in real life. Um, and one example is when your airline asks you to pick a seat on an airplane. Uh, they don't ask you, you know, to, to specify some constraints or some utility function as to how you want to be placed. They just tell you, hey, here are the seats, um, and you pick one according to your own preferences. Okay. So I'm going to just go into a, a bit more detail and show you the Mesos um, architecture. Um, in Mesos, we have a, a master um, and a number of slave nodes. Um, and um, we also have these frameworks that, that talk to the master. So each framework has two components. There's a scheduler at the top, which, uh, accepts, which uh, accepts or rejects resource offers and launches tasks. And then there's an executor. This is a binary that just runs the tasks for your specific framework. So in this example, we have MPI and Hadoop, and Hadoop uh, has no tasks running. Uh, MPI has two of them, but maybe we just submitted a new Hadoop job, um, and I'm going to show how the resource software process works. So the first thing that happens is that Mesos knows that there are available resources on some of these nodes. And uh, it consults a, a pluggable module called the allocation module that um, implements the inter-framework scheduling policy. So here you can do something like priority. You can do fair sharing. The one we've uh, spent the most time on is a, is a generalization of fair sharing for multiple resources that Ali Godsey is going to give a, a talk about in this session later on. Um, and so, so the allocation module just tells you which framework to offer the resources to. Uh, once it's decided, you, you put together um, resource offer, and the resource offer is just a list of nodes and a vector of available resources on each node. And uh, then you send this to the framework. In this case, let's say it was Hadoop. Um, and the framework scheduler then can do its own framework-specific scheduling. So for example, in Hadoop, uh, Hadoop might care about data locality, and it might see I have data on slave two, but not on slave one. So I'm only going to launch a task on slave two. And uh, the framework can return zero or more tasks. Um, and here we're going to send back one task. Um, and then on slave two, the, the Meso slave, its job is to launch um, and isolate the executors from each other. 
So it's going to launch a, a Hadoop executor. And for the isolation, we, we just use OS mechanisms uh, such as Linux containers. So the last thing that happens here is we saw Hadoop rejected some of these resources. So now we can go and offer them to, to a different framework as well. Um, and um, the, the, so, so there's a couple of things to note here. So one, one thing is that we've separated the inter-framework scheduling, um, which is done by the allocation module, from the uh, intra-framework scheduling, um, which is done by each framework independently. Um, and uh, the other question you might have is, you know, how does the framework decide when to accept and when to reject resources? And for this one, we, we found that a simple policy where you just wait a, a short amount of time for resources that you like um, actually works pretty well, um, at least for things like data locality. So, um, so I'm going to show some results for that later. Okay, there's one, one other piece with resource software. Um, um, so just doing plain resource software might lead to resources being rejected a lot of times before someone um, uh, likes them. So there's an optimization we do called filters. Um, and with filters, um, you, you can s specify a Boolean uh, predicate to the Mesos master that tells it I'm never going to accept resources, say, with, with fewer than eight gigabytes of memory. So don't even offer them to me. And the Mesos master treats this exactly the same way as if you rejected those resources. Uh, so this, this allows us to short circuit the rejection process. You can imagine adding other kinds of hints um, here as well, but the, the key um, um, aspect of our model is that because you have the ability to accept or reject ultimately, you can ensure correctness in, the, in, in the which resources you get. And then all these other things, the filters, are just an optimization to reduce the number of offers that have to happen. And we've gotten pretty far using just offers uh, without having to do any kinds of filters or hints. Okay, so that was a tour of the architecture. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the implementation. Um, we've implemented Mesos in, in about 20,000 lines of C++, um, and uh, we use Apache Zookeeper uh, to have a leader election among multiple masters and to have a failover. Uh, and we've ported a bunch of frameworks to work on top of it, especially Hadoop, um, MPI, and Torque. Uh, Torque is a, is a scheduler for uh, HPC, actually, where you can queue up MPI jobs and have them execute. Um, and uh, to show, you know, I talked about specialized frameworks providing benefits um, over general abstraction. So we've built a specialized framework as well called Spark that's optimized for iterative um, applications. Um, and it can outperform Hadoop by a factor of 20, um, primarily because it can keep data and memory between iterations and, and be able to um, reuse it very quickly that way. And we've also open sourced the project. Actually, in uh, December, the project entered the uh, Apache Incubator. Um, that was a quick tour of the implementation. Uh, we're also fortunate enough to have some people using this. So uh, Ben Heinemann is working with Twitter uh, to run Mesos there, and it's running on more than 100 n nodes now and running about a dozen production services. Um, we have machine learning uh, groups at Berkeley using Spark. Um, Conviva is also using Spark for data analytics. And we're also working with some researchers at, at UCSF to run Hadoop and eventually uh, Spark as well. Um, on top of their clusters. Okay, so I'm, now let me talk a bit about our results. Um, so remember we had these, these four goals. We had utilization, diverse frameworks, uh, scalability, and reliability. I'm going to show some results for each of them. So for utilization, um, I'm going to, to compare how we do uh, compared to static partitioning, both in terms of utilization and job performance. Do jobs do better in a shared cluster? Uh, for placement goals, I'm going to look at achieving data locality on Mesos, and I'll also talk about scalability and um, robustness. So let me start with, with this. This is just a picture of the system in action um, sharing resources um, among four frameworks. So this is actually a macro benchmark we ran where we took these workloads. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about the workloads. The details are in the paper. But we basically had Spark running an iterative job. We had two instances of Hadoop. Uh, the red one was running only large batch jobs, one after the other. And the blue one was running a mix of small and large jobs based on the Facebook workload. Uh, and finally, we had uh, some MPI jobs running on top of Torque. 
So there's a few things to notice um, about this graph. Um, so first of all, um, the, the frameworks um, have varying demands across time. And when the demand of some frameworks is low, other ones can scale up uh, to fill in the empty resources. So in this case, for example, uh, the large Hadoop mix uh, has scaled up to more than um, uh, three quarters of the cluster because no one else except Torque is earning jobs. And so you know, it gets to finish jobs faster as a result of that. Um, of course, in, times, in other times when, when they all have demand, um, we get, you know, they each get about a quarter of the resources, and we were using fair sharing here, so it makes sense. Uh, the little spikes at the top are because Spark actually scales up and down between each iteration, and we, we fill in the gaps with, uh, with Hadoop tests um, for that one. Uh, and the last thing to notice, actually, is, is how quickly we can transition between these allocations. So it, it takes, you know, um, under 10 seconds to, uh, to scale a framework up from 0% to 25% of the cluster, for example. Okay, so this you know, shows we're sharing resources dynamically. We have a colorful graph. Does it actually help the frameworks? Um, so we also compared this workload um, against a statically partitioned cluster where we just gave each framework 25% of the nodes. Um, and here are the speed ups that the frameworks get running on top of Mesos. So all the frameworks that have fine-grained tasks here that are Hadoop and Spark um, do better on Mesos. And uh, the one that does best is the, the large Hadoop mix, which where on average jobs finish two times faster. And uh, this is because it actually has the most demand, and it fills in a lot of the gaps in demand of the other frameworks. Uh, the, the Spark and Facebook Hadoop mix have less demand, and so they, have less, they benefit less from scaling up, but they do benefit from it. And uh, Torque and MPI does about similarly um, on the shared cluster as it does by itself. Okay, so this is, now we've talked about utilization. Um, now, can frameworks also meet their, their placement requirements? That's the next question. Um, and um, th th to do this, um, we ran a test um, um, of trying to achieve data locality using resource efforts. So Mesos doesn't know uh, about framework placement needs such as data locality. Um, and um, to, in this test, we ran 16 instances of Hadoop MapReduce on a shared HDFS cluster on 100 nodes. And um, we, um, we wanted to see, you know, can they actually still achieve good locality? And as the, the policy for when to accept or reject resources in Hadoop, we use this simple one called delay scheduling, where you just wait a few seconds uh, to, to get a local um, offer. And if you don't get one, you fall back and you accept non-local ones. So what, what we see here is, um, if we look at the first graph, uh, data locality, um, with static partitioning, we get terrible data locality because everyone has only on 1 16th of the nodes. Um, and um, with Mesos, on the other hand, uh, we get about 97% data locality. So you know, this is pretty close to optimal because you can't get more than 100%. Um, and this improvement in locality also improves jobs completion times. Uh, so here they, they improve by a factor of 1.7. Okay, um, next I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the performance of the system itself. Um, so scalability. So one reason Mesos can scale pretty high um, is because it only performs this inter-framework scheduling, things like fair sharing or priority, where each scheduling decision is pretty easy to make. Um, and uh, in, in it's, it's easier than having to look at task dependencies and data locality and things like that within each framework. So as a result, we, we've scaled Mesos uh, to, to handle 50,000 uh, slaves. Um, we, these were emulated slaves. We don't have 50,000 machines, but we ran 200 machines on Amazon EC2 and the number of slaves on each one, and we had them all connect to one Mesos master. So the traffic hitting that master uh, was the same as if you had these 50,000 nodes, and it, you know, it, it was basically handling 50,000 TCP connections uh, and, and uh, managing these slaves. Um, and on top of this, we ran 200 frameworks. Uh, there were 100,000 tasks, two tasks per node, and the average task duration was 30 seconds. And uh, the graph here shows um, that, uh, sh shows um, what, what we measure here is the overhead of starting um, uh, a new, of running a new framework, basically, once this, this cluster is in steady state and all the resources are filled. So once everything was running, we would launch uh, a new framework that ran a 10 second task, and we, men we measured how much longer it took than 10 seconds. So this is the time to register with Mesos, get a resource offer, get a reply back, um, and so on. And it's always less than a second which is what we wanted to do. 
Finally, let me talk about um, fault tolerance very quickly. Um, uh, the reason we can um, recover quickly from failures is because we only have soft state. We only need to make these inter-framework decisions, so we just need the list of current frameworks and how many tasks they each have on the nodes in the cluster. And we can recover this um, when uh, the, the frameworks and slaves connect to a new master. And uh, in our experiments, this takes about 10 seconds, mostly due to timeouts in Zookeeper for deciding that the old master is dead. Okay, that's the evaluation. Let me finish by talking about related work. There is, of course, a lot of prior work on sharing clusters, but a lot of these environments are different from the modern data center environment. Um, so in HPC, I already talked how they do coarse grain sharing because they have these inelastic jobs. Virtual machine clouds also do coarse grain sharing for long-lived VMs, and uh, they give you few, few controllers over placement. Uh, Condor is a very successful project with a centralized scheduler with a very flexible matchmaking engine, but we found that some cloud policies, such as delay scheduling, uh, couldn't be expressed very easily using Condor. And uh, the closest uh, system to our own is, uh, is a next generation Hadoop design uh, developed in parallel by Yahoo, where they um, uh, change Hadoop to have two level scheduling, um, and they also want to support uh, non map reduce applications. So th this system does fine grained sharing, but uh, it, it uses a, a central scheduler with a request language with locality preferences instead of resource offers. Uh, so, so that's it. So in conclusion, with, in Mesos, we share um, clusters efficiently among uh, these frameworks thanks to two design elements, fine-grained sharing um, and resource offers. And we allow a, a current frameworks to coexist. We also allow the development of specialized ones like Spark. Um, and we've open sourced the system, and we're starting to get some experience um, using it as well. Thanks for listening. George Porter, UC San Diego. Great talk. Um, so uh, in the resource offers you talked about, you mentioned like CPU and memory. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning of the talk, you said you also supported Ruby on Rails or were interested in doing that. Yeah. So how do you handle network bandwidth between competing applications? Yeah. That's a good question, and actually, the person who's going to talk about that is right here. So we, uh, we, uh, we didn't build a new network isolation mechanism, but we can use other ones you have in the data center, and this next talk's actually going to be about sharing the data center network. Yeah, and same, you know, we, in, so far, we haven't focused on new isolation mechanism. We just wanted to use the existing ones. Yeah. Can Kandula MSR. Yep. Could you comment a little bit on whether the gains from multiplexing are coming at the cost of predictability? At the cost of predictability. Do you see a lot of variance in your job completion times? Do you have a hard time, you know, yeah, ensuring half your nodes go to a certain Yeah, yeah, that's a good load? question. How, how this affects predictability. Um, so, so, so this will actually depend a lot on your uh, inter-framework scheduling policy. So for example, with fair sharing, you can ensure that each framework has, say, at least 25% of the cluster, so you can put an upper bound on how long it will take. Of course, it might uh, finish faster, and that will increase the variance, but it might do it in a way that you like. So yeah, we, we have, um, I, I would say that we, we have the same characteristics there as other systems like the Hadoop fair scheduler or other cluster sharing systems. I'm at Arkady Konevsky, VMware. Um, had a question. You mentioned that uh, multiple uh, frameworks will run tasks on the same nodes. Yep. So uh, the frameworks, as you mentioned, all, were all designed with the idea that they fully control yes. their all underlying hardware. So when you put them on, on a sharing uh, node, uh, how do you control security, or do you use yeah. the virtual machine model? Yeah, no, th these are good questions. So how do you isolate frameworks on the same nodes? So we use uh, OS isolation mechanisms. We've used Solaris projects uh, and, uh, and Linux containers to do this. Linux containers are a little bit like Solaris zones or projects. Um, and uh, you can imagine using other mechanisms as well. These are just the ones we chose. So we rely on the OS to do this. Hello, I'm Walter Schwarzkopf from Cambridge. Yeah. Um, so you've, show, you've compared static and dynamic partitioning in terms of sort of uh, spatial uh, division of the cluster. So you've, set, uh, you've divided it into, into four smaller clusters conceptually. Yep. Um, have you looked at all at uh, time-based uh, uh, division of the cluster? So you give the whole cluster to each of the frameworks and then obviously oh, you, would expect the completion, you would expect the completion time of jobs to be quicker because there's no interference between frameworks. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. We, we haven't done that, but it's, um, 
it's not necessarily that the completion time will be quicker because with something like fair sharing, if, if a new job comes in, it can start getting resources right away. If it had to wait for the next time slice, it, it might take a while. Unless you're talking about very short time slices, but you, then you have the problem of you know, if they use memory, for example, how do you uh, swap them out that quickly? Yeah, okay. did I understand that? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, okay thanks. Thank you again, Matei. Yeah.